Welcome to the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. Um, my name is Annie Polland. I'm the Senior Vice President for Programs and Education, and I'm so glad to welcome you here tonight for this program on myths about immigration, past and present. Um, how many have been to the museum before, been on a tour? Excellent. Okay, and some of you I see have been on numerous tours and have even given tours. I want to call out our educators, some of our, educator museum, uh, our educators at the museum who are here to join us tonight. And the reason that they're here um, is that they're interested in the topic, but the way that we frame this program is um, we're going to hear from Ali Nurani and his wonderful new book, um, There Goes the Neighborhood. Um, but what we also want to be doing is taking some of the things he's found in his work across the country, in his work talking about immigration, and his work talking about Americans, talking with Americans about immigration. Um, we want to find out what insight he has on how we can do our job better at the Tenement Museum. How can we respond to some of the ideas that our visitors have about immigrants? How do we take apart some of the myths that visitors have, both positive and negative, about immigrants past and present. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear from um, Ali Nurani. He's going to tell you about his wonderful new book. Um, and then I am going to come back. And joining me tonight is a wonderful panel of um, sociologists and academics and writers who have a lot of experience in this field and are going to help us think about these myths as well. So I'm going to do a short kind of introduction of all the people, and then we'll move into the program. Um, so um, the panelists include Mustafa Bayoumi, who is the author of the award-winning book, How Does It Feel to Be a Problem? Being Young and Arab in America and this Muslim American Li and also This Muslim American Life, Dispatches from the War on Terror. Um, he is a professor of English at Brooklyn College, City University of New York. Um, we also have with us tonight Nancy Foner, sociologist and author of so many books. She is a professor at CUNY Grad Center um, and um, from, JF, from Ellis Island to JFK, um, and also um, one out of three about immigrants in New York today. Um, those books, all the books that I'm mentioning, will be on sale uh, at the shop after the talk. And we also have with us Phil Kazinitz, a sociologist and author of Inheriting the City, The Children of Immigrants Come of Age, and many other books. And um, all of our panelists have not only excelled in their fields, which is a wonderful achievement, um, but they've also excelled in their work at the Tenement Museum. And we brought them here to be able to share the kind of experiences that they've in turn shared with our educators. Um, and so now I'm going to introduce Ali um, Nurani, who is the author of there Goes the Neighborhood, this book, which I have read cover to cover, and it's wonderful. Um, and he's also the executive director of the National Immigration Forum. Um, and a couple of years ago, and he'll tell you much more about this, but a couple of years ago, he realized that in his role as executive director, um, it wasn't enough just to talk to people in the blue states about immigration, and that he needed to extend beyond that pool of people and be able to talk about talk to people in red states and talk about what's in the culture that we're making people either welcoming to immigrants or not welcoming to immigrants. And he focused on this really well-named um, strategy: uh, Bibles, badges, and business talking to people who are evangelical ministers and had immigrants in their community, in their parishes, talking to law enforcement agencies, um, law enforcement agents who were dealing with communities that had lots of immigrants, and talking to business owners who had immigrants as well, and hearing how they could become allies in a broader struggle and talk for immigration reform, um, and talking to them really seriously about some of the issues and the anxieties that are coming up in the communities that they're in. Um, so we're so excited to hear from him. Please join me in welcoming Ali Nurani. Good evening. Good evening. Wow, this is amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, first of all, I really want to thank the, the museum and all the staff and the volunteers here. Uh, it's just a, an amazing group. It's an amazing space. The trustees here are incredible people. Uh, it, this is just a, a space that I think means so much not just to the neighborhood, uh, the, the city, but you know, or the state, but really how the country understands the journey of immigrants to the United States and how people have become a part of the, fa the fabric that we all enjoy. Um, so I start with a heartfelt thank you. Um, and it's really, really great to see such an amazing audience. And 
I've never been on a panel so qualified, so I'm lowering the bar this evening. Um, the story starts on December 18th, 2010. <clears throat> on that one day in the United States Senate, two things happened. One is the, uh, uh, um, uh, the efforts to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, passed. The other thing that happened on December 18th, 2010, just a few hours prior to that vote, is that the DREAM Act was defeated. I remember being in that, that, the, the Senate that day, and I remember uh, working with some incredible colleagues and uh, a range of advocacy organizations uh, working with DREAMers, and I remember uh, thinking that we were going to win you know, going into that morning. And I remember thinking that you know, we had, you know, there's no reason we wouldn't win. We, we had done everything we were supposed to, and we lost. And um, I realized that, okay, if we lost at kind of the height of our political power around ostensibly what should be the most compelling issue that we have to present to the American public, what went wrong? So moving backwards from you know, that day in December 2010, I uh, looked closely at the, you know, at the two movements, the movements to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell and the immigrant rights movement over the course of the year or two running up to 2010. I realized that those who were advocating for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, they ran a strategy based on culture. They ran a strategy that engaged the military establishment, that engaged policymakers on the question of what it means to serve your nation openly and freely. Those of us in the immigrant rights movement, we made sure that uh, Latino voters were uh, uh, registered, or they were turning out, that we were focusing on the swing states of that year. Um, but it wasn't enough. So I'll, I'll read the last couple paragraphs of the, the first chapter. <clears throat> we thought the immigrant rights movement had followed a similar playbook as the Don't Ask, Don't Tell community. We demanded action. We got arrested in front of the White House, including yours truly. We politically organized ourselves ahead of the election. Going into that vote, we knew policy wasn't the issue. There was a history of bipartisan support. We believed politics was the issue, and we had won for politics. The political power to force a vote on sound policy got us within one mile of the finish line. What we learned is that last mile, riddled with landmines of race and class, is not completed by politics and policy alone. The last mile is America's identity crisis. Elections matter, but culture matters more. Right now, too many Americans and media assume there goes the neighborhood when immigrants become a part of their communities. Until conservative white America sees the cultural and demographic changes to their neighborhoods as a net positive to their lives, this will remain the assumption and the identity wars will only worsen. What we fail to realize is that people are scared, not necessarily in a bad way, but they're scared they will lose their jobs then their homes. And they're scared of the new neighbors who look and sound different, who might be coming for their jobs and then their homes. With fear comes a lack of trust and mutual respect. Opponents of immigrants and immigration reform prey on this fear to their benefit. Supporters ignore this fear to their peril. In the lobby of the Methodist Church that afternoon of December 2010, I remember telling a colleague, without fully understanding what I was getting at, we are going to do things differently next time, which is what this story is about, a different approach to the immigration debate. This is not a story about the next legislative fight. This is a story about Americans dealing with immigration to their neighborhoods. What America struggles with is bigger than any one piece of legislation. I believe that by not understanding the fears behind America's identity crisis, we fail to provide the framework and vehicle through which we can reach Americans' hearts and minds. Solving this problem is not impossible. Liberal or conservative, we need to be willing to meet people where they are, but not leave them there. So after that vote in 2010, uh, the National Immigration Forum, the, the organization that I'm, uh, that I'm thrilled and honored to, to run, uh, we embarked on a strategy that engaged conservative faith, law enforcement, business leaders in really specific parts of the country. We focused on the parts of the country, frankly, that did not vote for the DREAM Act in 2010. And that was the Southeast, the Midwest, and the Mountain West. And we realized, after looking at the data and, and, devel and developing a sense of, OK, how do we engage in these communities, we found that those same three regions have the highest number of adults who identify as evangelical Christian. Those same three regions have uh, uh, the highest density of state and local law enforcement. Those same three regions have the fastest growth in the foreign-born population. So we overlapped those maps and 
that's how we came up and developed and came up with this network that has come to be known as Bible Badges and Business for Immigration Reform. And uh, I, you know, I kind of stumbled upon the, the term in 2012 when uh, Adrian Walker, who's a columnist of the Boston Globe, who I'd known over the years, I'd worked for 10 years in Boston, he calls me up and says, you know, the re-election is coming, and you know, what have you learned out there? I said, well, you know, I told him about the strategy, what, who you're working with, and I said to him, we found that if you hold a Bible, you wear a badge, or you own a business, you want a constructive solution to the immigration challenge. Uh, so I realized in you know, December 2015 that um, the organization and I have had this really unique perch on the immigration debate. And when you read the news, you know, that perch is not represented. So I wanted to write this book not just to, not only to give voice to the organization's work, um, but also to, frankly, to tell a different story about the nation's immigration debate. So over the course of uh, um, spring of last year, I interviewed nearly 50 faith, law enforcement, and business leaders, the majority of whom I would, you know, would identify as socially and politically conservative. Um, I, I spent time in Houston, suburban Houston, in Utah, in uh, Indiana, and in South Carolina. And in each of these regions, I, I learned that, you know, and this was, it was interesting because most of the people that I interviewed, I had met before, but there were a handful I had not. And you sit for, with a person for an hour, and you begin to know, you begin to understand why they care about immigrants in their communities. So I thought I would, you know, before we turn to the panel, I'd read um, the closing passage uh, from my time in South Carolina. In Spartanburg, in South Carolina uh, has seen the fastest growth in the Latino population, second only to North Carolina. So the state has changed dramatically. And the way I wrote it was that it felt that as the textile mills were moving to Mexico, Mexico was moving to South Carolina. Uh, and I interviewed the principal of uh, Arcadia Elementary School, and he told me about how he went through a process of, of uh, realizing the demographics of his school was changing, and he needed to change with the school, or change with his, with his students. Talked to a, a teacher who was teaching adults how to learn English, uh, and her innovative strategy was to have the immigrant who's learning English sit down with the GED student who's trying to get their diploma, who'd been born and raised in South Carolina, and how do they teach each other. I met with uh, uh, Southern Baptist, or Baptist leadership of the First Baptist uh, Church in Spartanburg, one of the largest Southern Baptist churches in the state. They told me about how the church was resettling Syrian refugees uh, regardless of their religion. And this was, again, at the height of, just as we were reaching kind of peak Syrian refugee crisis. So um, <clears throat> to set the scene on this, uh, um, uh, Norman Blanton is a teacher of this after-school program at Arcadia Elementary School, as well as being the ESL teacher um, there during the day. And we had spent, I spent the evening there kind of watching the um, financial literacy classes. <clears throat> and we were walked back to her office afterwards. Where South Carolina goes on identity, so goes the South. If South Carolina can devise ways to manage such rapid demographic change by marrying liberal and conservative strategies, across a range of institutions, the approach can be replicated across the region. To a certain extent, that path will be determined by demographics. Eventually, the size of the Hispanic population will lead to important leadership roles across civic society. But more than that, it will be the negotiation of culture and values between communities. Families like those of the Blantons, the Smiths, the Lamis, or the Prietos are just a few examples of how immigrants and immigration will change South Carolina <coughs> and South Carolinians. After we visited the, the financial literacy class at Arcadia Elementary, Norma and I returned to her office. The ugly politics of the 2016 presidential race re-entered the conversation. Norma knew immigrant families were afraid to come to school and were afraid to go shopping. <clears throat> she told me of, fa of a father who was afraid to drive to the Walmart down the road to get food for his children. She told me, I thought this is the United States of America, for heaven's sake. Nobody should be afraid to drive to Walmart to buy food for their children. It was my last interview in South Carolina. I had met incredible people, ate amazing food, and learned more than I could ever imagine. Norma, I asked, what gives you hope? She paused, she looked down at the table, her eyes teared up, and she told me, they keep coming back. Thank you.
thank you so much. Um, one of the things I thought about when I was reading your book is the emphasis you placed on talking to people, and again, how people's minds were changed because of the people that they were interacting with. And I know many of you have visited the museum, but just for those of you who haven't, I just wanted to share the way in which we also use stories of people to kind of go beyond debates that people have about policy. So, um, so when people say things like, immigrants back then pulled themselves up by the bootstraps, we can share the story of Natalie Gumpertz, a German Jewish immigrant who was here in the 1870s, who did pull herself up by the bootstraps in opening up a dressmaking shop. However, she also received charity from the United Hebrew Charities. So it's a complicated story. Well, sometimes we have people say things like immigrants back then were legal, which is complicated on a number of <laughs> angles, and we'll talk about that too, but we're able to share the story of Rosaria Baldizi, who came here in the 1920s after the 1924 immigration quotas were passed, um, and she came without papers. And she got her papers, she became legal, through a program sponsored by the federal government that recognized in the 1930s and 40s that there were so many undocumented European immigrants and came up with a way for them to get citizenship in the 40s and 50s. Um, so we can complicate the story of the past as well. More recently, we've been able to draw on stories from students, often college students in New York and elementary students and high school students who have been sharing their stories through this website above me, um, but it's on all of your phones and computers as well. It's, and you can share your stories. It's called Your Story, Our Story. And we just ask people to pick an object that tells their immigration or migration story in some way. And these stories have shown how complicated the lives of immigrants are today. Um, and uh, Mustafa's, students, M Mustafa's students um, contributed beautiful stories um, from Brooklyn College, um, and, and there are thousands of them. And these stories allow us to show really complicated portraits. For example, a, a girl wrote about how her um, Chinese immigrant parents wanted to Americanize so much that she didn't even know what object to share about her immigrant past until she had to do this project and found a photo album that showed you know, the past. But the emphasis was when she's in America, her parents wanted her to Americanize. And that also helps us complicate things when people say immigrants today don't Americanize. So there's all of these wonderful ways that we're able to use stories to complicate the picture. However, we always want to be learning more about different frameworks that help us bring in facts to help us frame the way that we're sharing these stories. So that's why we brought everyone together tonight and we want to hear from you as well. But first I want to start with a question um, for Ali. And one of the things um, you mention is that you know we often in our circles use terms like inclusivity and diversity and an expansive American identity. And we think of those terms in incredibly positive ways. But some of the people you were meeting across the country hear the same words and hear something different. And I was curious if you could kind of talk about that. Well, that's what I was uh, getting at when I'm talking about the America's identity crisis. Um, you know, when, I mean, the fact is that when an immigrant is coming to any neighborhood across the country uh, that hasn't experienced these changes before, the assumption is that you know, the, the neighborhood's culture will change, the neighborhood's values will change. Um, and what we found is that you know, as an advocate you know, paid to, to uh, advocate for immigration reform based in Washington, D.C., I am not going to convince anybody. But what our, we've learned is that they're, you know, the, the pastor, the police chief, the small business owner in that community who is you know, wrestling with those very same questions, they can lead that sort of a conversation. Um, so the question of identity is, I think, at the core of this, um, because it is, you know, underneath that is, you know, there, there are fears of, that are cultural, that are economic, that are based on public safety and terrorism. Um, and, you know, I just think that a lot of us who live in big cities on the coast, we forget that. Um, and it takes all of us to you know, kind of get out of our bubbles. And so um, I'd like to turn to some of the sociologists, historians, <laughs> to talk a little bit about other moments in American history where there has been fear and anxiety, um, and that's then shaped the way that people have thought about newcomers. 
There's always been fear and anxiety about immigrants, right? I mean, that's uh, it's part of the American way, right? I mean, that we, and it's something that we tend to forget because I think when we look back to the past or when so many Americans look back to the past to their an immigrant ancestors, they tend to romanticize or have a kind of, you know, look through rose-colored glasses. You know, they assimilated immediately. They spoke English, you know, five minutes after they got here. Well, not quite, but, you know, I mean that they, uh, that they were perfect, you know. And against that kind of image, one of the problems is, is that current arrivals can't possibly you know, measure up because that those are not real images. Those are, um, you know, romantic views that are that would never were. Um, so I mean, there are just so many ways. I don't know if we want to talk about, you know, which way, which ways you want me to talk about to begin with. Uh, but you know, well, well, let's take one thing, okay, just to start off, because Donald Trump, right, you know, talks a lot about how immigrants today. Um, you know, commit crimes, right? And there's so this notion in the past, you know, they, they didn't, they were law abiding, right? But actually, that's a similarity with the past because actually immigrants um, have very low rates of committing crimes. They commit crimes at lower rates than natives. That's true today, just as it was in the past. Um, and there are some ways actually that immigrants today look better in a way than immigrants in the past. Um, for example, immigrants today uh, actually naturalize at higher rates, many of them than immigrants in the past. Um, immigrants, I don't know, we'll talk more about language, but um, it, we know that for one thing, a lot of immigrants today come already speaking English, right? And in the past, that's different from the past. So those are just some of the ways, just to begin. I don't know if you, I should pass it along here. What would you like me to do? Well, I was just gonna follow up with the, with the fear and anxiety if there are some moments in American history where people for the, the very same people that you're talking about who romanticize the past and think about the wonderful, hardworking Italians or Jews or Irish, moments in the past where Americans, uh, some Americans were fearful or anxious about their arrival. I'll say yes and pass it to Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then I've got oh, you have your own mic. <laughs> okay, is that, on? that's on? Yeah. Good. Um, well, obviously, there uh, is a long history of resistance to whatever the most contemporary group of immigrants has been. Um, but I guess the, the, the first moment that we all think of is the Know Nothing Party of the 1850s, which has the singular distinction of being the most accurately named political party <laughs> in American <laughs> history. The Republicans have rarely been small are Republican. There are long periods in history where the Democrats have been extremely unsmall d democratic but the know-nothings absolutely had r truth in advertising on their side. Um, but that's just one of, and, and the other thing is that they, uh, their great presidential bid was um, focused around the, the idea of the political comeback of former President Millard Fillmore, um, which also didn't work out, although Fillmore's role as worst president in American history is now really being contended. <laughs> so, you know, maybe they're coming back. I, I, I think that it's important, uh, particularly in the New York situation, to remember how much resistance there were to Italian anarchists, how much resistance there were to Jews, um, the degree of violence. I mean, not everybody was immediately happy. I mean, the early 20th century was a period where there was outbreaks of terrorism. Um, much of it politically motivated for communists and anarchists, but some of it also, you know, but heavily concentrated in ethnic groups. We tend to remember the Red Scare of 1919 as basically an anti-far left, an anti-Bolshevik uh, uh, development. But if you just look at the names and the list of who was deported, it was essentially an anti-Jewish, uh, particularly anti-Lower East Side development. So um, there's a long history of resistance, um, I think that one of the things that um, we're getting to here, and that I think your book beautifully illustrates, is that Americans have historically always sort of worked on two tracks as far as this goes. The immigrants in general at the ideological level could be seen as symbolic of all sorts of things that were very threatening. Immigrants that we actually personally knew were always okay, you know, and then, and and there, there are real issues, and we shouldn't make those uh, downplay those issues. 
in the incorporation of large numbers of people who are culturally or religiously or linguistically different. Um, there are always real issues of competition. Um, but those tend to be worked out in very practical ways with people you know on a face-to-face basis. The one thing that makes me a little depressed sometimes is that sometimes getting to know people on an individual basis doesn't really change the ideological thing. Immigrants are terrible. Well, oh, he's fine. <laughs> you know, and, and our ability to make, rather than challenge our ideological assumptions, we tend to simply make a lot of exceptions. One of the things, too, you wrote in your book, and this is related, but that there are some people who view 1965 as the moment that America entered the 21st century, entered its future. And other people view 1965, I think it was Lou Dobbs, who you mentioned in the book, who viewed 1965 when we have a passage of a new immigration um, law that lets in people from all over the world, um, many people who had been excluded for decades um, to come to this country, that Lou Dobbs and others view that as um, what, the death of American culture or something like that. And were these views that the people you were interviewing held or had held at one moment and then had their experiences changed through interactions? Or how did the people, that the 50 people you interviewed, where would they have fallen on that spectrum? Well, uh, um, so I, one of the people I did interview was, was Lou Dobbs. And um, you know, I've gone on his show a number of times, and we always kind of come to this impasse of, well, we need to have an honest conversation. So I said, OK, let me ask the questions this time. Uh, um, and then, you know, I, you know, when the book came out, I, he had me on a show, and he actually endorsed the book. I'm sorry, we killed book sales tonight. Uh, no. uh, um, so uh, I'll tell a story that, that I wrote about in the book. Um, it was an interview with uh, Barrett Duke, who at the time was uh, the vice president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. Southern Baptists are about 16 million strong. It's the uh, second largest denomination uh, uh, in the country, second to, to the Catholic community. Um, Barrett, born and raised in New Orleans, went to seminary in Texas, in Dallas, planted a church in Denver. All through his life, he never had an experience in immigrant, with an immigrant, so he never had that personal interaction. He moved to D.C. to take on this job as vice president, uh, and he realized that he needed to figure this, this, the issue out. Because up to that point, he was a, a rule of law American. You know, they did something illegal, they should be punished accordingly and, and put it, uh, you know, and, and, and put into deportation. So he, he told me in the interview, he said, what he did is he turned to his Bible. And he realized that you know, the Bible would t- taught him to welcome the stranger. But there's also a, you know, as we're a nation of laws, and the Bible says that you, know, you, you obey your government. So there's, so there's a tension that came out in the conversation with Barrett that I think is a tension that millions and millions of Americans feel every day on this issue. Uh, and that they want to welcome the stranger. They want to be compassionate, but they also feel that we are a nation of laws. So I think some, you know, we often, I, going into this process, going into the project, going to the strategy, the assumption, my assumption was, well, you wake up being anti-immigrant in the morning and you go to sleep, all of a sudden you're, you're cool. You know, every, everybody's okay. But the fact is there's a tension. Um, and people are always going to swing back and forth, and some of that will be influenced by political leadership, by you know, what you read, somebody reads or sees on television. Um, but I feel like if we are doing a better job of acknowledging that tension between being compassionate and being a nation of laws, we can then help people get to a place where, you know, yes, they love the Jose they know, but they also realize the Jose they don't know is a good person. Um, and it's not simple. It's not like there's not a formula here. Um, and that's, you know, and that's what I think when we talk about this issue purely as political or purely as policy, we're approaching it very in a very formulaic way. And uh, that's not how the majority of Americans deal with this. And this book came out right, or you finished writing it before the election. But so um, I, I did the interviews, I finished writing it, um, you know, October, and then the edits were after afterwards. And uh, I think the question you're going to ask is, did it have to change anything? Um, no. And, and I don't know how to feel about that, to be honest with you. Uh, I you know, made a few edits uh, uh, here and there, but I, there was nothing, no substantive changes to the stories that I was telling, the conclusions that I, I drew. Um, and it's because I think the challenge, by and large, remains the same. And so one of the
one of the things I was wondering in reading this book, because you said that you know these people, what makes this book so fascinating too, is thinking about these people, the 50 people you interviewed, and how complex their identities were and their political identities were in the sense that they you they couldn't be categorized in particular ways, and that the same person who might be um, pro-life is also um, you know pro-immigration reform. At the end of the day, do you know where your people, when they went to vote, did they talk about who they voted for? And I'm curious how they're thinking about immigration and the badges and the Bibles and the enforcement, how in the end of the day, how that influenced their vote. So one of the people that I also interviewed in South Carolina was um, Harold Smith. Um, and I interviewed him in March of last year, as on Super Tuesday in March. So you know, CNN is flickering the background on mute, the returns are coming in. And he's you know, sitting on his recliner, rocking, and we just finished dinner with his family. You know, Harold, born and raised in South Carolina, uh, um, been there for generations, uh, in favor of immigrants and immigration reform. And he told me, he said, and, but he also told me why he voted for Donald Trump at the primary and what that dynamic was like. Um, and a quote that he, uh, he told me, what he told me really sticks in my head is that he said that, you know, my granddaddy didn't own slaves, my daddy didn't own slaves. I didn't own slaves. Why do I feel like I'm being blamed for everything? I just, I'm just like you. I want to go to work. Um, so he calls me two days after the election. I'm sitting on my couch. I haven't moved for two days. Uh, uh, just kidding. Uh, I see the phone with his number. I'm like, okay, this is going to be fun. Uh, um, so, hey, Harold, how are you? He said, I'm good. What do you think? I said, Harold, you were right. You know, there are things happening in the country that we, we have to figure out. Um, and I said, Harold, I'm worried about what a President Trump is going to do when it comes to immigration. And he said, don't worry, don't worry. He was, he was just making a deal. He was making, he was, you know, it was just rhetoric. I said, okay, Harold, if Trump moves forward with what he promised on the campaign trail, you're going to be the one that has to speak out. You're going to be the one that has to say something because only you can stop him. And he paused uh, and he said, I know. So I think there's a lot of conflict in the minds of the Trump voters, and um, you know, he was just one of the one of the people I talked to. Yeah, it'd be so fascinating to go like six months later, right? And what are they thinking? Because, as we know, um, it wasn't just rhetoric. And in January, he um, was it a Friday in January that I remember so vividly, where he um, did what you know the the Muslim ban or the executive order, and. Um, you know, I thought a lot about this executive order because um, for the exhibit that we're planning here at this museum that's going to open up <laughs> one day <laughs> upstairs, <laughs> it keeps getting delayed, but hopefully July, September, something like that. One of the stories we're telling is of a refugee family who came from, um, who uh, the parents had survived World War II, had met in displaced persons camps, and were coming here, you know, and were able to come here because of an executive order that Truman wrote. And what Truman had said is, we need to alleviate human suffering. We need to start to cooperate, to take a part in alleviating human suffering and human misery. And again, wasn't able to bring everyone over all at once, but through this executive order, allowed the expedi uh, ex allowed um, officials to expedite the granting of visas and allowed this family to come over. So I wrote this short little piece about talking about Truman, not even mentioning Trump, because you don't you don't have to. That th this executive order does it without saying it. Just th the contrast is there. Um, and someone on the face it was posted on our museum's Facebook, and someone wrote on the Facebook feed, um, "Well, back then people weren't trying to blow us up." So, and we've heard other things too uh, in the halls of our tours, and, and granted, most visitors don't say things like this, so take this with a grain of salt, but one visitor did say, and I overheard it, or no, I overheard the tour, I didn't hear this line, but I learned of it from many witnesses afterwards, but the visitor said, 7.5% um, of all Muslims are terrorists. Um, which is crazy, um, you know, because as our museum director joked, it's 7.4 percent. But how do you know these <laughs> these numbers? It's, it's a crazy thing. But what do we do with this? And um, Mustafa wrote a beautiful piece in the Guardian about this, and I wanted um, you to talk about this. Oh, oh, and actually, the, the second. That's helpful. Oh, sorry. Um, which 7.5 percent of me is? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's also true that, and I think sometimes it's forgotten, that um, Japanese internment was also established by an executive order. Uh, so
So I think it's really important to consider the ways in which, you know, um, the ways in which our executive power is wielded, and it is wielded also very ideologically at very specific moments on the backs of immigrants. And it seems to me that what we're looking at um, with Trump and his desires for the travel ban, which, you know, travel ban one will fail, travel ban two, I think, will likely fail. But what people aren't paying enough attention to, if you ask me, is the fact that they have also instructed State Department officials to uh, vet the, uh, um, the visa requirements for people coming from uh, non-visa waiver countries, and it'll disproportionately affect Muslim countries as well. So what they can't accomplish through law, they'll accomplish through bureaucracy. So it's going to ha it, uh, if, it, if it hasn't, hasn't, isn't already happening, it, is, it will happen, right? And I think that this is actually going to be really to the detriment of the United States, even just from the point of view of losing all kinds of talent. There is a whole lot of, uh, approximately one quarter of the world is Muslim, by the way, right? So that's more than 7.5% anyway, but it's also a lot of talent that you're actually going to end up losing. So in fact, when I wrote, I, I'm writing for The Guardian regularly these days, so I can't remember which one it was, which piece it was. It might have been that, the, the piece that you have there, but I wrote, it, I wrote a, a piece that was something about this issue, and um, a physician from the UK wrote me, and she said, yes, you know, I have a fellowship coming to go to Boston for next year, and I don't think I'm going to take it now. Uh, and uh, that's just one example. I think there are many examples. And I think uh, that we need to, you know, understand that we shouldn't be basing our policies on the basis of our own national prejudices. And it seems to me that this is essentially a replay in that regard, then, of going back to the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was essentially also basing a kind of fundamental f a federal policy on our own national prejudices. And I think that it's really, uh, it will be a detriment to our country. <laughs> By the end of the night, I'll learn which microphone to use and which not to use. Um, but to go back to, again, this anxiety and the fear that's in the country that we experience at the museum, how do we, how do we, how would you respond in that case, if you're the educator on that tour, and someone says something like that, and this is a, a question for any of you, like, wh what to, what to say? Do we go through the whole history of exclusion? Do we try to think about why this visitor, where, th where is this visitor coming from that he or she is saying this? Any thoughts on there are a lot of, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I, <laughs> um, I mean, for one thing, you know, uh, uh, we, as Phil was saying earlier too, I mean, there was, a, there's a history of political violence even hitting New York City prior to 2001. Uh, so you can think about, you know, in 1920 there was a bombing on Wall Street. There were, there was the, uh, the Los Angeles Times was bombed in the, in the early part of the century. The Haymarket riots, you know, we have there, there's. We have uh, Puerto Rican nationalists uh, bombing city, uh, parts of the city in the in the seventies, and so somehow we've ex we've decided that that none of that counts anymore, and that only this contemporary m memory counts. And so I think I think letting people remember things for one thing is important. Second of all, of course, uh, you know th th that's. Th this will disproportionately affect vast numbers of Muslims uh, because it's only uh, a very small number of people who are involved in this. Uh, uh, and, and of course, not only that, but you gotta think about the ways that the United States' policies also produce violence in the world too. So if you don't think about that, then, then you're not thinking uh, responsibly about the role of the United States in the world. So, but you know, all that being said, m people, it's hard to convince people uh, because they're, they're, they're determined. But I also, d I also really do think though that a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment that we hear today and anti-Muslim sentiment also that we hear today is a lot of displaced anxiety about other issues. And so I think having a really uh, open conversation about those kinds of other issues, and I think a lot of them are economic issues, a lot of them are loss of privilege issues and these sorts of questions. Uh, you know, I think that we really ha need to address those. And you know, I'm not. So, uh, I haven't had the chance yet to read to read your book, Ali, and I really look forward to it. But um, um, it's interesting that you are going to South Carolina too, um, because yes, there's a vibrant economic future that's sort of happening in South Carolina. But there's also a lot of deunionization that's happening in places like South Carolina. 
And a lot of that deunionization produces a lot of economic anxiety, and a lot of that economic anxiety will also end up reproducing a kind of anti-immigrant sentiment. So until we, until we can think about things holistically, we're always just going to be so um, reactive and defensive in our responses. Um, I don't know if this would convince people, but <laughs> um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions about Muslims in the United States. Not only that they're, most of them are law-abiding and not, you know, not terrorists and not blowing anybody up, but the fact is, first of all, the, America, the percentage of Muslims in the immigrant population in the United States is very small. It's about 4%. So you know, we're, we're talking about, one, a very small percentage of the immigrant population. And in the United States as a whole, Muslims are about 1%. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, many, many Muslim immigrants are highly educated, very well educated. Their incomes, they're, they're middle class. Um, uh, um, you know, they're not this kind of stereotyped image that people have of Muslims. So I think that and the studies show that they, they want to become American, they want to integrate, um, they change in the United States. They have very, very high rates of naturalization, which actually even surprised me when I looked at the statistics. Seventy percent of Muslim immigrants um, have become U.S. citizens. That's very, very high. So I think that, you know, I think that, I don't know if that would convince people, but I think it might help. I think the other thing, and just to say, and I think this is some, something I find deeply, deeply disturbing about Donald Trump, and here's a case where we're going back in time. <laughs> um, you know, when immigrants came 100 years ago, there was no such thing as political correctness. I mean, in the newspapers, people made all kinds of terrible comments about Jews and Italians. You know, Italians were the stiletto, that Jews would never assimilate, that they were money grubbers. I mean, that was all in the press. Um, you know, we have had a civil rights movement in America um, in which, you know, we have toned this down. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, which made it incorrect and to say many of these things. And what's happened, I think, under President Trump is that he himself has legitimized at the highest levels of society, the presidency, these kinds of statements about Muslims about Mexicans, about undocumented, and I think this is the, uh, to me, un because that makes it legitimate to say. And I think, to me, that is of something, that, that is a step backward in time. I mean, that is not, that is where we are sort of going back in time, having moved ahead. I mean, not that, you know, so I, I, I just wanted to add that as something that I find disturbing. Yeah, I was going to say that, um one of the appeals I suspect for many people to Donald Trump is the renouncing of hypocrisy. You know, says what he means kind of thing. And, and getting behind, get, yeah, get beyond political correctness. And maybe a mature way of thinking is to remember that hypocrisy is sometimes just the acknowledgement that our actual practice falls short of our ideals. And that, uh, you know, two cheers for hypocrisy. The fact that some of this stuff was no longer acceptable in public discourse was actually a very good thing, even n despite what people might actually believe. But I, I just want to reiterate uh, something Mustafa said in that I do think that an awful lot of the discomfort that people feel with immigration is displacement and a displaced, very real anxiety about growing real inequality in the country and a, a perception of a foreclosing of opportunities along with demographic change which really have to be, you know, dealt with. And while I don't believe that the Trump vote is entirely racist, I think it's important to remember that the danger in American society is because racism is so much our original sin that when in doubt, in troubled times, it's very easy to be come back into the discourse. It's always there in the background for people to use and perhaps bring to the surface. It's not the better, angel, uh, better angels of our nature. It's not the thing people, like the people you're talking to in the Carolinas, want to go to first. But it's always a possibility. And I think that what we've seen in the last six months has been a real increase in going to that when the anxiety may actually you know, lie elsewhere. Thing really quickly about that is I remember we were doing a focus group on our new exhibit and what became clear to me was that someone on our group was saying you know uh, you know being very clear they're not racist but they still think white people should have more than others 
<laughs> you know, that, that it shouldn't be that that way. It was very, like, and I can't remember exactly how it was phrased, but that was, that was what, was, and not seeing the dissonance in, in that kind of statement. Um, and so I guess um, I would say that in a lot of ways this isn't about Donald Trump. Um, this, you know, none, of the, none of the things that are being brought to the surface are new. Uh, it's just that they're being brought to the surface. Uh, and it's scary uh, for us, or for me. I mean, I, uh, the funny part about writing a book, the book was that it became much more personal than I expected. Um, and I went back to a moment on December 7, 2015, when Trump announced his commitment to ban Muslim immigration. And I remember thinking, okay, I just got back from Mexico City. Um, I advocate for undocumented immigrants, and my family's Muslim. I'm a Trump trifecta here. Um, but I'm, so I'm in my sister's place in LA, and the next day I'm packing up to, to head back to DC, and my passport's sitting there. And I, I think that, well, you know, I pick up, and I had not said anything. Organizationally, we had not said a, a thing yet for like 48 hours, which, you know, those of you who follow the forum, that's kind of unheard of. Um, so all we do is jabber away. Um, but I pick up my passport, and it hits me. I said, I took a picture. I posted it in my Facebook feed, and I said, I've, I'm proud that my parents immigrated from Pakistan, and I have one of these. So it became very personal. Um, and in the interviews that I was doing, I, you know, for example, one of the people I talked to was uh, Greg Zeller. He was the attorney general, Republican attorney general in the state of Indiana, for specifically when then-Governor Pence tried to bar Syrian refugees. And he told me a story of you know, his legal strategy to extend the case, um, but then, as a devout Catholic who grew up on the shores of the Mississippi in southern Indiana and on the board of Catholic Charities, that he was not going to flinch from his Catholic beliefs that he needed to be a part of welcoming refugees. Um, so again, it kind of goes back to that tension. And I just think that, you know, as awful and, and terrible as these moments, these times are, it's also just a really, really big teaching moment. And going along with teaching, one of the sections I liked the most, I mean, I liked every section, but there was <laughs> a part about um, a school and, and the way in which, and I don't remember the name of the woman, I don't, maybe it was Norma, I could be wrong, um, and she went to the school and she arranged all of these classes. So to, to speak a little bit about that, the way that communities are working to educate and work with immigrants who want to learn English. So uh, uh, Norma is the person that I, I referenced in the, the last passage that I read, and uh, she had partnered with uh, Jana White, um, who's an adult education teacher in, in uh, South Carolina. And I went to visit Jana, and um, uh, you know, was, she, she, wouldn't, she wouldn't let me ask a question. I think she talked for like 55 minutes straight. It was great. Uh, um, but I remember sitting in her, her office. It was like a narrow room that almost also doubled as a, her classroom, and it was lined with maps from around the world. And I said, well, these maps are amazing. You know, it must be so great for your, your, the students who are learning English. And she said, oh, no, 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 this isn't for them. Those aren't for them. Uh, I said, really? She says, the only time they use it is when they're telling the American, the native-born students where they're from. Um, so she had, found, he, she had developed these strategies to create relationships between native-born students who were getting their GED and the students who were coming to learn English. And uh, she told me story after story of how you know, these relationships were then leaving the, the classroom, how they were, you know, sharing meals, how they were uh, communicating in, you know, on Facebook. Um, and it was, but, you know, she also said that she just kind of did things and she waited for her administration to, to catch up uh, because, you know, she, she, w she felt like there was a different way to do this. And we know that all across the country, um, immigrants want to learn English and sign up for classes to do so, and that there aren't enough classes often to meet the demand. Um, but yet again, one of the things we hear, and you can be my witnesses, the people who are on the front lines, our educators, have any of you ever heard someone say, immigrants back then learned English? Did that ever? No, that never <laughs> happened. <laughs> so I think it's worth, because it's a, a chestnut that we have here, um, to, to bring this to our panelists to think about, first, on the one hand, we can talk about stories that we just heard, of stories in different parts of the country where immigrants are going to high schools to learn. And not only is that a good learning experience for the immigrants themselves, but creative teachers are figuring out ways where the native-born students can be learning from this process. So we you know, we know that. But to kind of go back to what we can do to complicate the idea that immig immigrants back then learned English. I know that this is a Phil, this is a Phil question, right? <laughs> well, I, I think the, um, the important point is that immigrants did learn English, but it took a lot longer than we think. I think part of the problem is when we look at history backwards, we tend to telescope it. 
So the idea that, you know, my grandfather learned English on the boat on the way over, and, you know, it's, we, you know, we're seeing it from the end point. And I think it's important to remember that the incorporation of a huge array of people from all over the world, despite all of the problems and despite the obvious racial barriers, the fact that the United States incorporated this massive number of people, mostly Europeans, admittedly, um, you know, who had been in many cases deeply oppositional to each other in their home countries, um, is one of the great achievements of the history of this country. And we should, we, you know, that's an achievement we need to be proud of and we need to think of that as a resource. That's, that's really historically important. But it took a lot longer than we think. And I think that that's uh, the other piece of the lesson, that a lot of times what we think of as an immigrant story is a children of immigrants story. Um, because things re really did take longer than it looked like from looking from the end point. From three generations, because we know, I mean, one of the sociologists like to say, you know, Im uh, the United States is the graveyard of languages, right? That we know that, well, that immigrants coming, particularly as adults from another country, speak where they come from a country where they speak another language, they're more comfortable in that language, although they begin to learn English. The second generation learns English, but often, often speaks the home country, the parents' home country language. By the third generation, overwhelmingly monolingual English. The evidence shows this was true in the past, and it's true in the present. And since Phil mentioned the small steps, um, another myth, right, is that, I mean, from the old days, right, I mean, if, you know, for the Jews in the audience, maybe you don't have to be Jewish to know this, right? It's this notion of, you know, my son the doctor, right? But it really wasn't my son, the doctor. It was my grandson, the doctor. And what happened was mobility in smaller steps. You know, the children of immigrants did somewhat better than the, the parents, and then the next generation did even better. And it was mostly in that third generation that there was a bigger move into the professions. And we see that we saw that in the past, and we're seeing it now. So I think you know there's you know th that's again a similarity between the past and the present. But I just wanted to make one other comment, and I don't really have an answer to it. You know, in light of Ali's discussion of immigrants in South Carolina and outside of New York, right, and <laughs> in so-called emerging destinations where where immigrants are going, and I think one of the challenges in the social sciences for sociologists and political scientists is trying to understand why some communities are more welcoming than others. Now, obviously, in every community, there are going to be some people who are more welcoming and pro-immigrant than others. But what we find is that some communities pass anti-immigrant legislation, for example, or are voting overwhelmingly for Donald Trump based on an appeal, in part, on his, the, you know, and the build the wall with Mexico and, you know, a kind of nativist appeal. And so, is it, you know, communities that, one of the things that communities, interestingly, that have so few immigrants often seem to be those that are the most anti-immigrant, even though they don't have many. And that, and this would support one of much of what, some of what you say and what some of the literature also says, is that when there are immigrants in your community, even though you may not be their best friends, right, um, but you see them, you get used to them, and you may be less likely to, to be, you know, anti-immigrant. I'm just, but we don't know, you know, I think this is an area, right, this is very easy to say as a social scientist, right, we need more research, but <laughs> we really do, particularly as what's happened in the last couple of decades is that there's been a, a dispersal of immigration away from the traditional gateway cities. I mean, New York still gets as, uh, is the most traditional of traditional of gateway cities, right? Um, that we still get a lot of immigrants in New York, so does LA, uh, so does Chicago, but immigrants in the last couple of decades have been moving to places where they al sometimes almost never were, like in the South, because they already had, you know, the <coughs> descendants of slaves to do much of the work, low-level work, or the Midwest that hasn't seen immigration in a very long time. And it's in those areas that, you know, I think we often almost pro maybe hope or also despair. <laughs> So one of the, the, the studies that I cited was uh, an analysis of the Gallup survey. It was last summer, and I keep forgetting the, the, the it was Rothman, I think, but I'm not sure that was his name. But in any case, Gallup survey is 90,000 people, and so it's a huge sample. Um, and one of the primary factors that they found was of why somebody would vote for Donald Trump 
in addition to being in a culturally isolated community, is that they did not feel that their children would do better than them. So that question of mobility, mobility generational mobility, intergenerational mobility is so real for so many people who are living in, in communities that, again, those communities are changing, or the communities one state, city, town, over are changing. Uh, there's this threat that somebody's gonna take their job and their kid will not do that as well. Uh, another place when I was in um, suburban Houston, I spent one day in Pasadena, uh, Texas, and the previous day in Sugarland. Uh, it kind of gets to your question of, of welcoming. Um, in Sugarland, it's about 30, 30, 40 percent Asian. It's economically, I think their their average inc median income is close to sixty-five thousand dollars. So it's a well-to-do community. There, and from a political perspective, you see an infusion of new Americans who not only are voting, but they're running for office as Democrats and as Republicans. And I interviewed a couple of them. They had just incredibly inspirational stories. 20 miles to the east in Pasadena, median income probably at half of that. It's a city now that is now 60% Latino, 40% white. And they are kind of the epicenter of the voting rights battle in the state of Texas, where the white community is, you know, the you know, political leadership of the white community is holding on to power uh, um, by the th you know the, the skin of their hands or however whatever the right term is, uh, teeth skin of their teeth, you, you, your teeth have skin. Um, <laughs> that, that's why yeah that, to me that's why that's what screwed me up there. Uh, uh, but uh, but what was happening in Pasadena is that again the Latino community was flexing their political muscle and they were engaging and I remember the person I interviewed was Ronaldo Ibarra, who born in the state born in Pasadena graduated from high school, entered the Marines, uh, came back, got his associate's degree, and decided to run for office. And I asked him, what was the most proud moment as a city councilor? And he said it was when his undocumented neighbor came to him and asked for help on a city service. When you think about that, that is such an incredible you know, moment of political agency when somebody who's undocumented sees themselves represented in that office and feels comfortable asking. And what, um, we've talked a little bit about history, we've talked about the present, I wanna end with talking about the future and where you think we have our best hope for the future as you think about your experiences throughout the country. Um, and if you could um, answer that while standing on one foot, <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> um, I, I remain, so a lot of people ask, well, who've read the book and kind of heard me, heard me talk, uh, you're optimistic, you know. Well, what are you smoking and can I have some? <laughs> Um, I'm optimistic because I think that a majority of Americans who are in the political or geographic middle of the country are, are engaging in this conversation in a really, really authentic and honest way. And it doesn't mean that they agree that we need to be welcoming immigrants. It also doesn't mean that they think that we need to be building a wall and deporting 11 million people. Um, so I was in Idaho about five weeks ago in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho. Idaho is a state with about a less than a 4% unemployment rate and I was meeting with the Idaho Dairymen. It's 4 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon, and they are grumpy because they've been up since 4 a.m. Um, but they've driven 20 minutes, two hours, four hours to be a part of this conversation because they're afraid. They're afraid of what the administration is going to do with regards to immigration enforcement. And of the 75 dairymen in the room, I would say 90% are Republican, and at least half of them have voted for Donald Trump. And they're not afraid just because they see the Latino workforce that's on their farms as you know, part of their, you know, their daily operation. It's because the Latino workforce in Idaho has been there for over a decade. These dairy farmers see folks as an extension of their community, as an extension of their family. So it's a very different emotion and anxiety that they brought into that conversation. That wasn't about politics, it wasn't about policy, it was about, hey, I know this person, I know their family. I don't want them to be harmed by you know, what's happening. So I'm optimistic because I think those are the conversations that are starting to happen across the country. Right. So um, in some ways I wanna just end with the note of optimism because we need it. Um, but I also want, what we also need to do is have conversations and have more opportunities to ask questions. And I'd love to start 
um, with our educators first, with the question and answers, because um, in some ways they're very much, again, on the front lines, having conversations with people from all over. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're never, you guys are always comfortable speaking. <laughs> and so I wanted to start with you, and I, I see, I know Josh is over there and Jacob, so you're not all in the same space. But if any of you have questions to start with before we open it up to the broader audience, and Christina's over there too, I see. I was just so intrigued by the model of um, the students learning from each other because that seems to me the model with which in immigrants can be welcomed without being assimilated, but just being welcomed for what they have to offer, that there is an exchange. Um, so I wondered whether from your studies you came up with uh, ideas of how that, that kind of exchange model could really become more pervasive, or how do you inspire people to, you know, on the local level, begin these kind of exchanges? Um, I'm not a, you know, I'm I'm not an educator, I'm, so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't. I wish I was, I had had the time or the expertise, much less expertise, to be able to look at these questions of kind of how do you replicate it. But I can just speak from experience. Um, so one of the programs we run is uh, called Skills and Opportunities for the New American Workforce. And the model is that we are working, we've developed a, a curriculum with uh, Miami-Dade College that's a blended curriculum of 60% offline, 40% online. And the curriculum is unique is that in that it's the only uh, English language curriculum contextualized to the retail sector. So here in New York, it's a partnership that is now between Westchester Community College and Whole Foods. And you know, for the immigrant community who works for Whole Foods, to be learning, improving their English skills in a way that's directly applicable to their jobs, that means, uh, and their managers are ecstatic. Um, we found that over the course of one year, each student that went through the program had at least a one level increase in proficiency. And we're talking only of, you know, I think it was a 14 week uh, uh, program, but then 30% of students saw a promotion as a result of improved English language skills. You know, because they had better communication skills internally, whether it was with their supervisor or with other staff. So I think there are a lot of models and a lot of innovative ways, and I just think that from the education perspective, um, we're starting to break out of the you learn English in a traditional way uh, mo mode, um, and I just think there are more and more innovative ways to do this. Excellent. Other questions from educators? This is um, Jacob. So I'm fascinated by what role does sort of the myths that we put around immigration play for people, what sort of psychic, I don't know, purpose does it, that on one level someone can acknowledge anti-Irish discrimination but then fail to see perhaps contemporary ways in which that happens, and then, I mean, ever popular ones, my grandmother worked at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory when it happened, which means that now all eight million New Yorkers have someone at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, or how sort of the, the Ellis Island name change yeah. as, as sort of a, a pervasive myth, and sort of what purpose does it for people to, to sort of tap into that. I, I think partly it's a way in which people can be supportive of immigration in general, which I think, and keep the notion that immigration is what made America great and that we're an immigration country, which I think is part of the ideology that most people accept, but say, well, but my relatives were different. And I think a lot of that actually does focus on legality because I think one of the big differences that people say is, well, but my ancestors were legal. And of course, we can get back to that, but the, I, mean, I mean, Annie mentioned the one case of the European undocumented immigrant, but by and large, I mean, overwhelmingly, uh, immigrants who came 100 years ago, first of all, they were overwhelmingly European. And they were, there weren't any quotas. I mean, there were no numerical limitations on immigration. So, you know, the, it was, and you, and you had to take a boat, you know, <laughs> and get through. So, I mean, it was, the, the fact is that for European immigrants, very, very few were undocumented. But, but it's a way of, I think, distance, both accepting this ocean of America as an immigrant country, but also saying, but they're not, you know, there's something different today. I, I think that's one aspect of it. Yeah. yeah, I think that one of the most effective parts of anti-immigrant rhetoric these days has been the, we're not anti-immigrants, we're anti-illegal immigrants because we're a nation of laws. And that, that's something you hear all increasingly from Trump supporters, you know, that 
Uh, of course we're a nation of immigrants. That's a good thing, but we're anti-illegal immigrants. And that's a tough one to argue against, but I, I think one of the things that we have to do in educating people is remind people that one of the reasons people come illegally is because laws don't work. And um, the one of the reasons that our ancestors may have come legally is because it was almost impossible to come illegally. There, uh, European immigration was almost entirely legal. That having been said, I recently learned that my wife's grandparents were illegal only because they were using phony names for all kinds of complicated reasons and were clearly violating the law, and there was a lot of that. But I, I think that the, the, this notion that the illegals are fundamentally different from others, we're now in a situation um, where 61% of the undocumented immigrants have been here more than 10 years. These are people who are part of communities. Precisely because mass illegal immigration really stopped around 2008, um, across the Mexican border anyway, you know, increasingly these are folks who are part of communities. They're not a community apart. They're often living in mixed status families with uh, people who are, have all sorts of legal statuses and semi-legal statuses. Um, this idea of illegal immigrants and criminality, which is an extremely effective rhetorical device, I think is one that we have to educate people about. There's a way in which people think all immigrants today are somehow illegal. Like they, they, they're not, even though they, even when they think about that, they make that distinction. Still in their mindset, they're saying all new immigrants are somehow illegal. So the first, the first thing for the educators is to simply say, look, what it's what one out of four, but roughly three quarters of all immigrants to the country today are legal. <laughs> you know. Plus, in the earlier years, there was it was very easy if you even once the registries were established for yourself to change your status with enough uh, residency in the United States, then you could easily change your status. Whereas now, you can't change your status; it's almost impossible without leaving the country. What about if you get in line? <laughs> that's <laughs> what that's what we often hear. We hear the. But, uh, but the they've the they've yeah, but they've been here like longer than the yeah right. Um, uh, and not only that, I mean, I know that uh, uh, many people that I know, uh, just having taught them over many years and asking about people's own immigration stories, it's, you'd be surprised, I was surprised anyways, at how many of them were children of, of the 1986 law. Uh, so it's, it's also, it's just a fabric, it's a part of the fabric of the country. But there's something, that was when the Reagan had the amnesty, you know, what's it called, amnesty, and yeah, yeah. But there's also something, maybe this is self-evident to people, but I just think it's so important to uh, emphasize which is that from 1924 until 1965, right, there was very little immigration into the country, and 70% of it came from England, Ireland, and Germany, right? It was very, very European, but m there was the, a number of immigrants was very low. So what that meant, too, it has uh, implications for everything. It has implications for Anglo conformity. It has implications for how English then becomes the dominant language, and for how you remember English being the dominant language. Because you don't have newcomers arriving all the time having uh, difficult English language skills, for example. Or and, and it just makes uh, the United States much more monocultural. So those years are the ones that people are romanticizing, and that was a very specific moment in American history. And you have, if we don't understand the uh, the, the historical uh, trajectory of that, then we're, I think, arguing against the wind in a sense. And kind of on that note, um, you know, when I, when I'm talking to, you know, your high, high your your tech CEO in Silicon Valley, and they're saying, well, we need more H-1B visas, I tell them, well, you know what, the voter in Kansas, when they hear you say, I need another H-1B visa, they hear you say, you need another immigrant. They don't hear you say, I need another engineer. Um, so I don't think that, you know, we, we can all talk about the history of immigration and, you know, as Doris Meisner who ran Immigration and Naturalization Services for President Clinton told me, she said, Americans look back on immigration, they, they, they value immigration in hindsight, right? So that means that our entire conversation has to be about how does the American worker and their family benefit from immigration? If we flip that around and say, how does you know, the immigrant benefit from immigration, we've lost the, what we've lost. So, uh, so the question was, how does the American worker benefit from immigration? 
Two weeks ago, the administration announced a uh, uh, executive order, you know, clamp or tightening the loopholes on the H-1B program. One of the uh, talking points that a colleague organization sent us was that uh, for every 100 H-1B visas, 182 native-born worker jobs are linked. That's right. That answers your question. But you want a better answer to your question. 182 native-born worker jobs are linked to 100 H-1B visas. It's a very simple flip of the script of putting the, the, the interests of the American worker first. And you look across, you know, you look across our, our website, I'll guarantee you, you'll find points where, you know what, if you had just flipped the script like that, it's, you know, you're, you're meeting somebody where they are, what their self-interests are. And um, we'll do, um, we have a question and then we'll get to Shana. Oh, there's one, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, okay. Um, so w when, when interviewing people for your book, um, I'm curious, you mentioned the H-1B visas, and so clearly there are some people who, who definitely understand, dif you know, differentiate between different types of immigration and visas and visas and all of that. But generally speaking, did you find that people uh, who are on either side of the immigration issue uh, found themselves uh, differentiating between, say, you know, traditional, tr traditional um, immigration, legal or otherwise, you know, coming across the border, you know, on a good visa or, or just overstaying your visa versus, say, refugees versus, say, Muslim immigration versus you know, uh, you know, European immigration. Yes and no. I think that more and more the American public is conflating refugees, immigrants who are here legally or undocumented. I think that there is a general fear of the other. Um, and, you know, I think that's the reality of the situation. And I feel like if we are trying to explain to a broad audience what's, what are the differences, again, we're, we're, you know, we're talking about policy. On the other hand, um, for example, within the conservative faith community, both the you know the Mormon community, the Catholic community, the evangelical community, there's a deep belief in the importance of refugee resettlement. Um, and I would argue that there is greater support among conservative faith uh, communities for refugee resettlement than there is for the legalization of the undocumented. That's slowly changing, you know, to a large degree because of, because of this conflation, also because congregations themselves are diversifying. Um, but I just don't think we can, we can't assume that people see the difference, and we also can't assume that uh, this is the time to kind of explain the difference. Yeah, since we're talking about some of these th these policy things, I mean, I think policy obviously is very important in the kind of work you do, but we also, I think, have to look, if we're thinking about change and immigration, to look at larger structural forces in American society that may give us some cause for optimism. And I mean, one of the one one is the mixing and mingling of people of different uh, that from different backgrounds, in especially in the second generation, um, at, uh, in schools, in colleges, at workplaces. We know that there one of the fun I mean, immigration has had an enormous effect on the demography of the United States. Latinos are now 17 percent of the population. Asians are what, 6%? I mean, there's been, it, it has had a huge effect. And that, by the way, that's, I think, where there's been a reaction to that. Um, but at the same time, another d change that we're seeing is increasing rates of intermarriage. In just, a f I think it's 2013, 15% of all marriages in that year were to someone of a different race or ethnicity, which was a ch double the figure of just a few years before. So that we're going to be having increasing numbers of mixed race children, and now another question which we don't have time to discuss is how that will differ among you know the children of white and Asian and white and Latino versus white and black. But there are going to be many more mixed families. There's going to be, um, and, and children who are mixed race. And those are just some of the forces, I think, that are going to lead to change that um, in conjunction, let's say, with policy. But I think we do, Another factor, by the way, that a lot of research is now being done on, particularly by political scientists, is the millennials, you know, who are growing up in a different time than their older parents and who seem to be more liberal on certain issues than their parents. And so I'm just throwing out some of these features that I think if we're looking to change in American society um, and New York, but also America as, as a whole, we have to look at those features. I think a lot of us who had more progressive views on uh, the question of immigration and corporation for a long time put a lot of faith in demography. 
respect, I think, to political people, put way too much yeah. faith in the young. Yeah. There's this idea that with the growing Latino population, with the fact that younger people are different from older people, with the fact that intermarriage is changing, we're going to, you know, doesn't matter what they think out there because demography's on our side. Um, I think that was a huge mistake. I also think, however, that we don't want to drop completely that, that those facts are still true. And yes, it will be a longer transition than we thought. It will be a more difficult transition than we thought. It's absolutely wrong of us to write off other you know, people who don't share that view. But on the other hand, if you are looking for optimism, those demographic transitions are happening. And they're going to happen, you know, whatever Donald Trump thinks. Hi. Um, admittedly, there are s some things, conclusions you drew that I had a hard time reconcile. So I just want to be honest and try to propose a couple questions, hoping you can kind of close the gaps for me. What's that? It's a safe space. Okay, great. Um, one was we talked about this romanticized view of immigrants in the past, and we compared that to the view now. Logically, think I'm thinking there's a premise that we're comparing apples to apples, and to me, I, you know, I'm a, I, I was a union president. I'm for legal immigration, for low-income workers, and I, I can't help but think, well, our income gap is way more than it was in the past, right? The the one percent, what they control in this country, and the the opportunities for the poor is absolutely different than it was in the past. Our national security concerns nowadays. You mentioned a couple examples, anecdotal examples of different terrorists, things that happened in the 20s. But we can't say it's apples to apples when you think about September 11th and everything else that's going along in the world. So my question is, can you help me reconcile that? Because I see those as apples to oranges. And then secondly, there was a point made at the end, if you allow me to ask one second question about the benefit of uh, immigration for workers. We had a little, a little thing here. I, I, I would like to hear more specifically the benefit of undocumented workers, how they would benefit. I would like to know what linked means. Does that mean that they created jobs or were they just associated with each other? And second, and last, I'd like to know how they would specifically help African Americans, which is a class that is in need of help within, internally in America. Um, so first of all, the question about uh, uh, apples to apples or apples to oranges, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and you know, with with all due respect to our nation's history and the importance of it, um, I think that at this moment, you know, in, on this issue, uh, history doesn't apply, and somebody's understanding uh, or perception um, of this debate and the uh, the anxieties that uh, people are feeling. And um, I think that you know, we rarely say we're a nation of immigrants. Um, it doesn't resonate with people right now. Uh, we, you know, that may have been the, you know, the America that our parents grew up in. It's not the America. Uh, it's we're we're asking we the proverbial we are asking the question of, of do we want to continue to be a nation of immigrants? Um, so I think that the apples to apples, apples to oranges, uh, 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 questions you bring up is real, um, and I think there's a longer conversation there of okay, what does that mean, and you know how do you unpack it? Um, the question about the the uh, benefit of the undocumented immigrant community. So when you look at um, you know, the, the literature, the economic literature, you know, there is a range, I mean, there, there are reams and reams of studies out there. The reality is that in the short term, uh, low-skill immigration has a minimal negative effect on the wages of low-skill American workers, African-American, white, Latino. They, uh, so I want to acknowledge that. Uh, and the numbers will say, you know, anywhere between, you know, one or two percent uh, change, maybe a little bit more. But it's always, for, it's not, it's not a dramatic, but it is a, a negative impact. The data will also show that over the long term, that impact turns into a net benefit. But that's all fine and dandy, and it's a study and it's abstract. Um, again, with all due respect to the, the researchers in the room. <laughs> right. Um, so, but doesn't the. the but the way I put this is that the only person winning right now is the crooked employer. The crooked employer is pushing down the wages of the undocumented immigrant, the documented immigrant, the native-born, black, white, Latino worker. So we can, you know, we can have a conversation of, okay, how do we make sure that the African-American worker is winning and, does that, and lead to a solution that says we need less low-skill immigration. 
or we need to be deporting undocumented immigrants. And I'm not saying that's where you're going. Or we can have a conversation of, okay, how do we make sure that folks who are undocumented are able to apply for legal status, pass a criminal background check, learn English, pay a fine, and as a workforce nationally, people are competing for the same job at the same wage. And that crooked employer is not on, can no longer undermine American workers, but can no longer undermine their competition. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to have a longer conversation about, about the other pieces, but I think that uh, uh, we've got to think about you know, who's winning in this situation um, and you know, who's losing. And I think that you know, the, the, the losers are, are you know, kind of everybody. The winners are very, very few. A friend of mine who voted for Trump, and I'm still friends with him, uh, brings up his concern about social issues. And by that, I mean um, Muslim immigrants, immigrants from many other countries are very, very conservative when it comes to um, women's issues, right to choose, LGBT issues, and other social issues. Um, he brings up uh, anti-Semitism in France and other European countries. And uh, with this concern of that influence on um, issues in our country, social issues in our country. So I would like to hear um, your reactions to that. Uh, well, we've heard those kinds of things also in the past for other communities. So there's, we, can, we can go down that road if you'd like. Um, but uh, you know, it's also important to talk about the American Muslim community so that we're not just talking about random Muslim communities around the world, for one thing. And generally speaking, the American Muslim community actually tends to be very progressive uh, um, and not so conservative, um, um, especially on gender issues, even, even on LGBTQ issues. Uh, uh, if you look at all of the survey data and the polling data, you might have a different idea in your head, but just look at the data and you'll see that it's different. But what's, what actually will, um, um, I think that what's, what sometimes what's behind questions like this, not, not your question, but just the move, is I think what we've seen since 2000, somewhere around 2001 to around 2008, when we talked about Muslim communities in this country, the, it was always framed through the question of security. And then after 2008 until today, it's often framed around questions of culture instead. So there's been a shift. So that before it was like, you know, we have they're, they're dangerous they're because there's, they're terrorists. And now it's they're dangerous because sh they were gonna implement Sharia law instead. Right, and so that's also a kind of cultural shift that we've seen p uh, previous in the uh, in this country too. Uh, and the fact is that you know, m as Nancy was saying, Muslims account for about one percent of the population in the United States. So the fact I'm pretty sure that on Tuesday you're not going to wake up and it's going to be Sharia law in the country. <laughs> pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. But the ways in which then it's also very ideologically, it's so simple then to actually inculcate a fear around. Muslims, because people don't know Muslims in this country. Most of the, the, the you know, polling data will also show you that six, at least 62% of the people in the United States don't even know, um, have never even met a Muslim person. 100% have an opinion about Muslims, <laughs> right? And then the other, th this is in line with what we were talking about earlier, because you can correlate those polls too with people who have, who have hostility towards Muslims and people who know Muslims, as, as people have done in at least two different polls. And what they find, again, it's a no-brainer, that if you actually know a Muslim, your, your hostility towards Muslims goes way down. Uh, so I just think, you know, I'm, I think that there's a lot of different ways about being Muslim, and th just like there's a lot of different ways about being American. We have many, many different definitions. We all think we know what it means to be an American, but there's a million definitions of what it means to be an American. And so when people make arguments around, well, Muslims are like this, then I think that there's some kind of, there's another thing that's at stake there. Yeah, and I would just add too that that's, I do think history is important. Um, 
And I have to say that as a historian, as, <laughs> as someone who works for an institution where we connect the past to the present. However, whether people are paying attention to history, that's another story. But I would say, um, too, to this point, too, about interesting stereotypes people might have of an immigrant group. Historically, people had really interesting things to say about Jewish immigrants. Either they were, you know, bankers, avaricious capitalists, and at the same time, socialists who were going to burn down the country. So these things kind of commingle various problems. So I think history is in mind. But you also might say to your friend, who I assume you're on good terms with, that that shows a kind of lack of faith in America. I mean, for a very long, I mean, Catholics were thought of as being much, much too rigid and conservative because they couldn't possibly be democratic individualists. They were pope ridden, all of that. Well, to some extent, America changed, and to some extent, Catholics changed. And the Catholicism and the Judaism that are practiced in America are fundamentally different than the way they were practiced in their home countries. And the same thing is happening very rapidly to Islam uh, and within Islam because people co uh, coordinate and cooperate. And I think that you know, daily life tends to sh sh wear down the hard edges, particularly when a group becomes a minority. And I think we should have a little faith in the incorporating ability of our culture. And what I would say, too, for your friend, and I'm going to give you this website, too. I'm going to push this. This Your Story, Our Story website, some of the most fascinating stories come from a category of religion. So if you look up religion under as a category, you see menorahs next to prayer mats, next to crosses, and it's like the same story. Whether sometimes what, What's different, and this has to do with how much time is spent in America, is whether the story is coming from someone who is fourth generation, or second generation, or first generation. So, so, so again, I want all of you to upload a story to this to help us be able to do this. Because again, sometimes these, um, it doesn't come through policies, it doesn't come through statistics, but it comes through the stories of real people. Um, and uh, yeah, so I wanna, uh, we should probably end. Are we at eight o'clock? Yes, okay, and people are hungry. So I wanna thank so much our wonderful panelists who have um, <laughs> leaped. <laughs> They have done me a huge favor of coming to a panel where I wasn't able to tell them exactly what to talk about. I just said, come and talk and we'll respond. So thank you so much for doing that. And please, um, these books, all of these people on this panel have written wonderful books. We have There Goes This Neighborhood. We have One Out of Three. We have Inheriting the City. We have um, two books by Mustafa Bayoumi up there as well. So um, I think tonight, if you purchase a book, you get 15% off. Do not go, do not take pictures of the book and go to Amazon because we will be able to track you. So if you want, we do. That's our surveillance at the Tenement Museum. The last thing I would say, um, is um, please become members of the Tenement Museum. This helps support the programs that we do, keep the programs that we do like this free. So become a member, come visit us. We have a great new exhibit that will open very soon. <laughs> so thank you all.